All right, back to Bergson and the holographic theory of mind. This will be part 34 on the question, is experience stored in the brain? Our second look at it. So we'll be looking at a researcher, Eleanor McGuire, on the hippocampus. The question, what does it really do? And the problems involved. Is all experience stored? Or just some of, it, of experience stored? Which is it? And the question for the researchers, have you actually looked at events and the nature thereof? And of course, the question of consolidation of memories assigned to the hippocampus. When does it do it? All in all, we're looking at the mark of the classic metaphysic. So is experience stored in the brain? As we have seen, Bergson's remarkable and powerfully argued answer was no. We also know that this violates a sacrosanct dogma of all current neuroscience, cognitive science, memory theory, and of course, AI. Heresy, ridiculous to consider that memory is not stored in the brain. Experience is not stored. My initial long discussion of the subject was number 16, storing experience, not in the brain, but these questions were also hit in various angles from number five, number 20, number 26, number 31, and, and others. And what we saw is in fact that memory theory is extremely unsettled as to how experience is stored. In reality, memory theory has no clue. This begins because there is no theory of experience that is perception, the very perception of the events that are supposed to be stored in the first place. And illustrative, the 70 year puzzle and debate over the role of the hippocampus. So we are going to look again at the role of the hippocampus, as this structure is the critical research focus of the problem of the storage of experience. We are trying to get the best bead on current thought, but the subject is huge. This will be a first pass. We need then is experience stored installment B. So I found an indexical exposition of current thinking in a talk by Eleanor McGuire, a professor of cognitive neuroscience at the University of College London given at the Royal Institution, 2014, for a, a common man, normal audience. The talk is consonant with her subsequent writings to this date and with the way she has incorporated it into a larger review of the subject. This is a 2016 review in year 2017 by Linda Dell, one of the key theorists and researchers in this whole topic of the hippocampus. And this review I plan to examine in the part B of this, of this experience storing topic. McGuire opens with a lesson on how memory works with context. Imagine being given this to memorize. If the balloons popped, the sound would not be able to carry since everything would be away from the correct floor. A closed window would also prevent the sound from carrying since most buildings tend to be well insulated. Since the whole operation depends on a steady flow of electricity, a break in the middle of the wire would also cause problems. Of course, a fellow could shout that the human voice is not loud enough to carry that far. An additional problem is that a string could break on the instrument. Then there could be no accompaniment to the message. And actually this passage goes on, and this one is supposed to memorize. Now, some subjects saw this picture before they memorized. It is a guy playing a, a guitar with a microphone, a speaker held up by the balloons. And so we get the idea of hmm, if the balloons pop, the sound wouldn't carry since everything would be away from the correct floor and a closed window would prevent the sound from carrying. And of course we need the electricity, the whole operation depends on electricity, etc. So obviously given that picture, you're gonna get what's going on with that paragraph and remember it a lot better. And Eleanor says, memory works better if drawing upon a context, if integrated with our knowledge of how the world works. Now, that is, we're talking common sense knowledge. Where have we seen this before? Oh yes, AI. And now we're gonna see it in memory and it's still not gonna be addressed in reality. Now, curiously, this 
heavily cited 90, 1972 uh, study by Bransford and Franks, uh, one being John Bransford, one author, who thought Bergson was very cool, and a contemporary of mine at the University of Minnesota, which was then a Gibsonian hotbed. Its true impl Gibsonian implications and other experiments he did have never, never been addressed, but we'll see it a bit. She then showed two or pics of two identical things, say, for example, a bunch of bananas, where the, the same picture was flashed a quarter of a second apart. So it's exactly the same picture, yet 60% of the audience thought the two pictures were different. She would later tie this to a boundary extension phenomenon. This phenomenon occurs in relation to static scenes because, again, we have access to tons of information about the world. We naturally draw a scene when drawing from memory with a larger boundary. So here we see the drawings of the bananas, for example, uh, and the hippocampus damaged patient draws just the bananas very close, closely focused on the bananas. But notice the normal folks, they tend to draw much more surround, bigger than act, the actual picture showed of the bananas, likewise for the pale. So normal folks draw a larger surrounding area when drawing from memory, the boundary extension phenomenon. And she says, quote, you have to imagine and construct what might be beyond the view. We do this instantly, constantly. So lesson, memory is not a faithful record of the past. It's not flawless, it's fallible. These sorts of errors are built into the very structure of the memory system. But now comes a fundamental shearing, a schizophrenia, a great chasm in current theory. She says, we often bemoan the fact that we forget that we'd like to remember more, but be careful what you wish for. And she notes the phenomenon of highly superior autobiographical memory. And here's a quote from a person with a disability. I am 34 years old. I can take a date between 1974 and today, uh, that is from 2006, that is from when I was two years old, and tell you what day it falls on what I was doing that day, and if anything of great importance occurred on that day. I describe that to you as well. Whether I, whenever I see a date flash on the television, I automatically go back to that day and remember where I was, what I was doing, what day it fell on, and on, and on, and on. And it drives me crazy. Now, I've noted this phenomenon before. Superior autobiographical memory is a relatively recent label. Examples, Oliver Sacks, retarded twins, who given a date, could tell everything about the day, what they ate for breakfast, what they watched on TV. This is from the book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. To quote from the book, as though watching a panorama unfold before their inner eye. Or Martin A. from the same book, who could quote verbatim any of the 6,000 pages of Grove's Dictionary of Music and Musicians, which Martin's dad, another musician, liked to read to his retarded son. This kind of thing used to be talked about in terms of a mimonist. And Luria wrote a famous book in 1965 about a mimonist with this kind of ability. So here we have evidence ostensibly that everything is stored and available for retrieval with extreme accuracy. So this is the chasm, the schizophrenia. Is the entirety of experience stored in the brain? How? Or is all past experience just created, constructed? But if two, if it's just constructed, how is it constructed so accurately, totally, in such detail, as specifically to account for autobiographical memory, superior autobiogra autobiographical memory. This question demands a resolution, either one or two below. One, a theory that shows how such massive, complete, accurate detail can possibly be simply constructed. Or two, a theory that treats construction as simply a 
superposition, a form of usage, a gloss, a form of modification on the fully detailed experience that is intrinsically there. But this is not what you see. A resolution is never addressed. Thus, predictably, this is where Eleanor goes. Quote, so we have established that there are different types of memory, that memory is not perfect, and that there are errors. The question is, why is memory like this? So the highly superior autobiographical has been subtly swept into the not perfect category and is about to be ignored in her answer to why. So she says, it has to do with this. Memory is not really about the past. So she proceeds at the vein of construction of the past. She notes the famous HM. After Scoville's surgery in 1956, in which his hippocampus was removed, he lost his past, could not form new memories, but did retain factual memories about the world, or what might be called semantic memories, i.e. he could remember that the capital of Minnesota was St. Paul. Short-term memory? Fine. Social skills? Fine. He appeared to have selective loss of autobiographical or episodic memory, or highly related explicit memory. The deficit was thought due to, to the damage to the hippocampus, and this was confirmed by other folks with very similar forms of impairment who also had damage to the hippocampal complex, the HPC. But in the 1970s, researchers found that hippocampus cells, hippo for short here, in rats respond to specific places in the environment. These place cells, as they were dubbed, seem to embody the memory for that particular place. So if we have a rat here in his circular area and he wanders around the area and he has an electrode in uh, his brain attached to one particular cell, that cell will tend to fire in a rather circumscribed portion of that whole area. And uh, so that's the firing of one place cell. So the hippocampus seems to be fundamentally involved with processing space. One of her own studies has been with taxi drivers. Using virtual layouts, in other words, you're driving virtually, like in the video game, of London. The hippocampus comes on initially when visually planning the route. So visual planning of the route. But a patient from TT who had no hippocampus, but had been a licensed London taxi driver for 40 years, the question was, how would the hippocampus damage affect his knowledge of the spatial layout of London? So the task was to get from St. Paul's Cathedral on the left there to the Bank of England on the right. TT took the black route. So if you uh, look in the uh, area here, this is the, the black route. He never really got there. He, he simply goes on the big roads not the smaller roads. He could not use these. Now this is known that the back part of the hippocampus is larger in London taxi drivers. For trainees measured before and after their training, which takes three to five years, three, three and a half years, the qualifiers had increased volume in the posterior part of the hippocampus. And the non-qualifiers had no changes. So she says the hippocampus does not work alone. It's part of a larger network, but there's devastating effects when compromised, especially here in spatial navigation, for starters. So the hippocampus involve, is involved in two seemingly different functions, navigation around the world or through the world, through London, and remembering events. Now this happens to include the consolidation in various areas of the brain that the hippocampus is given responsibility for. In fact, if we look at Wiki, we see the definition of the hippocampus says this. The hippocampus plays important roles in the consolidation of information from short-term memory to long-term memory 
and in spatial memory that enables a navigation. So there's these two functions, remembering and even storing events and spatial navigation. So what is it doing? Seemingly two different events or two different functions. So Eleanor, Eleanor took similarly, similarly damaged folks, hippocampus damage, asked them to imagine events in the future. They couldn't do it, could not imagine events in the future. Asked them to imagine a simple scene, like a bird flying across the water there. Nope, couldn't do it. One patient said, quote, there is no scene in front of me, in front of me here. I feel like I'm listening to the radio instead of watching TV. There's no visual scene opening out in front of me. Simply cannot visualize or envision anything. Another patient, it's, just, it's as if I had a lot of clothes to hang up in a wardrobe or clothesline, but there is nothing to hang them on, so they all fall on the floor in a complete mess. Which is to say, in effect, shall we say there's no spatial scaffolding on which to construct an event. They could imagine simple single objects, like a bird, so they could imagine, but they could not imagine scenes. And fMRIs show that the hippocampus is indeed involved in imagining scenes. Eleanor says, based on this, we suggested that the role of the hippocampus is to facilitate the construction of complex scenes into which the details of our experiences then get bound. This process underlies all of the bubbles on the right. That is, it underlies, that is having this ability to spatially cohere scenes, underlies imagining a scene, thinking about the future, thinking about spatial navigation, going places in an area, and episodic memory, remembering past scenes. So each requires a special ingredient supplied by the hippocampus, the ability to mentally construct scenes. This is where she brought in the boundary extension phenomena as another example of construction. It is, again, normal folks tending to construct, construct and from and they're remembering objects like the banana as a, a, a wider surround. Again, an example of construction of the memory. Brief interruption here. Let's add a similar view. This is from a 2017 talk, 2018 article by Elizabeth Buffalo from the University of Washington. She notes, studies in rodents, as we've seen, have also identified exquisite spatial representations in these regions in the form of place cells in the hippocampus and grid cells in the entorhinal cortex. But, she says, one striking difference between rodents and primates is the way in which information about the external world is gathered. Rodents typically gather information by moving to visit different locations in the environment, sniffing and whisking. Primates, by contrast, chiefly use eye movements to visually explore an environment, it's visual exploration, and our visual system allows for inspection of the environment at a distance. She examined neural activity in the hippocampus and adjacent entorhinal cortex in monkeys performing behavioral tasks, including free viewing of complex natural scenes and, and memory tasks in, a, again, a virtual environment. And the finding, spatial representations can be identified in the primate hippocampal formation in terms of place cells, grid cells, border cells, direction selective cells, so all these spatial oriented type cells, even in the absence of physical movement through the environment. In other words, just by scanning the environment. Thus, back to Eleanor, the actual reason for memory and the function of the hippocampus. To quote, memory is not about the past, it's about the future. It's about helping us project and, and, and infer based on previous experiences and prior knowledge, what to do next, where to go, what to expect. Thus, the purpose is survival. 
And memory works best in the context of our prior knowledge. And yes, it makes errors, but that's what makes it so powerful and flexible. It is not a perfect record of the past. It is constructed and reconstructed depending on our knowledge and state of the world. And finally, and I suggest that a key part of this process is the construction of spatially coherent scenes in the hippocampus that form the basis of our personal and shared past. So the primary elements here, the hippocampus, key in the construction of scenes in terms of spatial organization and coherence. In reconstruction failure, as with a damaged hippocampus, the past scene cannot be spatially organized or be coherent, so it doesn't happen. And number two, memory is not a perfect record of the past, she just said. And three, memory is of the past is construction and reconstruction. And implicit underlying this, she doesn't actually talk about it, the HPC is involved in storing in cortical sites aspects of, elements of, parts of, abstract gists of these scenes to be later used in reconstruction. Something is being stored as the material to create the scene. This seems to be the current consensus. But this consensus itself lacks a hippocampus. It is completely incoherent. The hippocampus, hippocampus is integral to constructing scenes. But a scene is just a static mindset of the classic metaphysics. As is endemic, memory research, research, researchers cannot bring themselves to consider the implications of Gibson. This is a scene. This is a dynamic, constantly changing, down to the most infinitesimally minute interval of time event. And it is a dynamic structure, where the invariants exist only over these very dynamic flows. That is, as I've noted many times, but again, the velocity flow fields, the adiabatic ratios, inertial tensors, acoustical invariance, texture gradients, ratios, flows. How is the hippocampus involved with supporting the ongoing perception of this event, this dynamic scene, and apparently its spatial aspects? Spatial aspects. Consider the possibilities. The changing position of the spoon relative to the cup the position of the hand relative to spoon and cup, the position of the cup on the table, the position relative of the table relative to the kitchen, to the body, the position of the kitchen relative to the house, or if we're in a restaurant, the position relative to the table, the restaurant, the friends in the restaurant, or other aspects of the ambient layout of the restaurant, and on and on. Inside the brain, as the event is ongoing, supporting this dynamic structure of invariance, there is massive resonating feedback from visual areas to motor areas, prefrontal areas to the visual areas, visual area to visual area, auditory to visual, etc. At the center of all this, the hippocampus. So in the context of storage, exactly when is the hippocampus storing anything? I would say it has all it can do to support the ongoing event. The hippocampus is considered storing elements, components, aspects of a, of a static scene at various cortical sites, and then cons consolidating these, and then later serving as a retrieval index to gather things back together in recall. Now I know the confounding thing always is that these cortical sites are equally, if not only, processing sites. They're always processing sites. So how, when, is it selecting anything of the event, selecting, selecting some parts, elements, gist, an abstract reduction of the event. 
or deciding, for, for that matter, whether the event is to be stored at all, by what principled method. So as we are dealing with static scenes, and therefore with elements from that static scene, specified elements stored at various cortical sites, then what happens when we deal with a truly dynamic scene? Well, then an event must be a series of static scenes where each slice of that dynamic scene now must have its elements stored at separate places in the cortex, slice after slice after slice. And then of course we ask, how is the hippocampus, if that be the case, selecting time slices of this event for storage, for its consolidation. At what rate? One-tenth of a second? One-one-hundredth of a second? By what principled method? And of course, we've seen this slicing sampling can't work in the first place. But we ask again, by what principle are the pieces or the elements of each scene selected? By what principle? Again, this is why I leave this event invariance structure, little picture on the right there, up, because one needs only to contemplate that for a moment to realize that the selection of pieces and elements is utterly and effortlessly destroyed as a possibility with just the most simple contemplation. But what one can ask, also, how are invariants that are defined only over change preserved in a static structure. Are we storing in a 3D space a 4D structure of slices? Even still, the event cannot be so represented because this event is dynamic, constantly changing down to the most infinitesimally minute interval of time. That is, no matter how tiny, how minute the interval of time, there is yet change. Therefore, there can be no fixed determinant values. A truly static scene with determinant values at an instant, at a static instant, a gigantic fiction. None of these questions ever enters the minds of the memory researchers. They live in a static world, the world of scenes. They're stuck in the classic metaphysic, and that is all this is. So in retrieval, all relies on the hippocampus as an index, which is somehow activated and brings all the storage components in various cortical sites of an event back together. But we are talking an event, not a scene. Now these stored components must be retrieved continuously in real time from ordered time mark site T1, T2, T3, etc. After time mark site, after time mark site, then imagine the nature of this index. I cannot. Now something Eleanor kind of forgot. The highly superior autobiographical memory. Again, Sachs retarded twins. Or Aldous, Aldous Huxley, who could go into a meditative state and view the pages of any book that he had ever read, or the Talmud scholars who could describe every word on each page pierced by a pin. So you take a pin and stick it through a book, and you, you would, it would pierce through multiple pages, and they could describe every word pierced by the pin in any of the 12 volumes of the Talmud. So this complete detailed memory of the past could be researched, could be proven. There have been some experiments, I'm just, I've been I'm neglecting them here, that indicate this, but the construction, the very notion of construction is so dominant, this pivotal base question is ignored. But this too must be accounted for by construction. This, this incredible ability down with this massive detail 
has to be accounted for by construction. But if all the past is just constructed, we must rely on this incredibly clunky, unprincipled apparatus to explain this extremely accurate recall. Every element or part or piece of every event, down to the minute, most minute aspect of the event, and every event must be stored in various cortical sites at the most minute scale of time, a vast series of pieces of, of static scene pieces that must be reassembled into scene after static scene, all of this indexed by the hippocampus for retrieval in the correct order. And then, of course, we get to other questions like, who watches this internal event unfold? Some sort of homunculus, state by state by state, and what provides the continuity, the glue. So that is perceived as a continuous unfolding event, just not a, series, a state, then another state, then another state completely independent and unconnected to the previous state. Now, is highly superior, superior autobiographical memory just better at this unprincipled, theoretically vague, lo logically flawed process? Why? We looked at in the context of events. Events are time extended, defined by invariance, existing only over the flow of the event, over the continuity. Now, with the fact that there are spatial components in the event, i.e. the position of the spoon, the place of the cup, the table, which the hippocampus could be involved with, it's reasonable, reasonable to suppose that the hippocampus is thoroughly, totally involved in supporting the perception of, of the dynamic scene. So what actually are the spatial components of a scene, an event for which the hippocampus is responsible? For example, what if the spatial link of the coffee event to the restaurant is broken? Well, what kind of spatial relation is the hippocampus actually used for? The spoon to the cup, cup to the table, coffee event to general location in the restaurant, in the kitchen? The spoon to the cup is extremely intrinsic to the event of stirring and its invariance laws. The coffee event to the general location, not so much. A cup to the table, yes, in the sense that a cup always needs support, but the particular table in the particular location. So in truth, it'd be primary to understand the hippocampus's role in perception in the first place. But what is that? If we take this from reintegration, which we discussed in number four, where E prime, the present event, reintegrates E, the past event, where E prime is a similar invariant structure to E, and thus the past event E is reintegrated, recall as an experience. Remember, this is retrieval without an index. It is content addressing as it's called, it is the content, the structure of the event is driving retrieval. But a coffee stirring event in and of itself will tend to reintegrate the class of events, the abstraction, the invariant or invariances across all events. Yes, there are individual differences indeed in each event, the cup color, for example, the cup form, and these alone may help reintegrate a specific event. Uh, but to reintegrate my coffee stirring yesterday, a host of context relations is needed to include the where of the event, its position next to the eggs and the bacon, the table, the kitchen, the, where the kitchen is in the house, etc. In other words, again, a set of spatial nestings, cup to table, table to kitchen, kitchen to house. Now, is all of this spatial relationship supported by the hippocampus. Now, clearly what I'm driving at is an event E experienced before the hippocampal damage and an event E prime with similar structure experienced after the hippocampal damage. And nevertheless, 
the two cannot be the same event. Something's got to be different, but how not the same? Well, remember the earlier noted Bransford experiment with the long paragraph and the picture that made sense of it all. The balloons holding up the speaker, the, the guy playing his guitar to the microphone, and the fact that that picture, that context made remembering that whole paragraph much easier. Well, consider another Ransford experiment with sentences like this. The haystack was important because the cloth ripped. The idea was to remember the answers to these sentences. In this case, the answer is parachute. Parachute, when it, when it ripped, it was a good thing that the uh, haystack was there. Or another sentence, it was important that the fat man read the sign. Answer, thin ice. Now, the interesting thing is amnesiacs remember the answers as well as normals. They just don't remem remember ever being told the answer. So this goes back, never remembering the answer, to an explicit memory problem, localizing the event, that is, when given the answer, in time. But it also means that they visualize, so to speak, that is comprehended, the soft landing event with its structure, soft landing via soft hay, or the potential ice breaking event, where given the structure of the event, weight, excessive weight on an ice that can't support it, there's a breakthrough, a fall through with all that involves. But they did this despite having a damaged hippocampus. Again, the structure we're talking about is the invariant structure that I've been showing with all the invariants. Take this sentence, the knife was important because the spoon broke. Answer, stirring coffee. Because we could insert knife into the invariant structure of the event and it will support pushing that liquid around appropriately for the event. This is where the whole problem of context, which is to say common sense knowledge, begins in the Gibsonian notion of invariance laws and invariance structure defining events, utterly ignored by memory theory. So in this, the hippocampus is not needed to support the event structure, that is the spatial elements thereof. So what is the hippocampus's actual role in event perception? Again, residing beyond the perceived event, this notion of nestings of spatial relations outside the house. Well, there's the driveway, go down the driveway to the road. I go north and then west, there's the coffee shop. Go south 10 miles, there's the Fleet and Farm store. In other words, an abstracted matrix of directionality from my previous experience. With a bad hippocampus, I am immediately lost, just like the taxi guy. Nor can I visualize a scene, for there's no longer fluid spatial scaffolding for it. Fluid spatial scaffolding, admittedly a kind of a Zen koan like phrase. But remember Kassir's patient who could not depict the objects in his room on a piece of paper unless given an X to show his position. He could no longer construct a schematic space, as Kassir said, with the fluidity of relations this implies. On the, or the patient who could hammer a nail if, hammer in hand, he stood near the wall but if the nail was taken away and he was asked to merely indicate, that is, imagine the act, he was frozen. Back to imagination. To quote Kassir, for this latter is the product of the productive imagination. It demands an ability to interchange present and non-present, the real and the possible. A normal individual can perform the movement of hammering a nail just as well into a merely imagined wall because in free activity, he can vary the elements sensuously given. By thought, he can exchange the here and now 
with something that something else that is not present. This requires a schematic space. The fluidity, the creation of a schematic space, requires the ability to establish a mobile center from which the space is organized. Kassir would relate this to a mathematical group, and Piaget would follow, applying the notion of the mathematical group to cognitive operations more generally. Now, the notion of a group, to give a flavor for this, take the 90 degree rotations of a square. These form a group. A group has four characteristics, an inverse operation, an identity operation, the operations are associative, and they're closed. And to make that concrete, again, visualize the rotation of our little square there. If you rotate that 90 degrees, well, there's an inverse operation. One can rotate it the opposite direction and take it right back where it was. There's also an identity operation. A 360 degree rotation will leave the square unchanged right where it was. The operations are associative. I can group them. If I want to achieve a 270 degree, ro degree rotation of the square, I can do 290 degrees which is equivalent to 180 degrees plus a 90 degree, or I can do a 90 degree and then 290 degrees or a 180, both achieve the 270 degrees. They're associative. And then closed, the operations always give a member within the group. You never get outside the group of rotations. Now, again, imagine our little rat back in, in his space, as we noted earlier. Again, there's a group of translations, spatial translations, where there's an inverse, there's identity operations, and the operations are associative as he moves through the space. So this gives a flavor of what's going on here when we're talking about the schematic space underpinned by a mathematical group. So Eleanor's new quote-unquote scene imagining deficit, and I'm not denigrating this in any way. I think it's a great insight and an extension, and that's why I picked her talk. But nevertheless, it's more than just being able to create a, a scene, the, the hippocampus underlying cr scene creation. There's clearly something beneath this, underpinning it. And therefore, the deficit is in essence an instance of this general problem that is the schematic space that underlies the imagination or the imaginary hammering or the ability to depict the objects in the room in the correct locations. So this newness is simply a symptom, I would say, of the researcher's lack of a broader knowledge, in this case of Kassir, where this underpinning, the schematic space was already pointed to. So again, what is the role of the hippocampus in event perception? One suspects given hippocampal damage, perhaps this. Any perceived event lacks the embedding in a schematic space, space, a fluid space underpinned by a group, a space that embraces one's entire large scale environment and one's movement translations within it. My best current take on the situation then is this. The hippocampus supports perceived events as embedded in a schematic space. And simultaneously, it provides a schematic fluidity for imagining scenes, that is events, with spatial relations, at least of some sort, complex of some sort. The prefrontal cortex supports an articulated simultaneity such that the present event can be seen in the context of a past event simultaneously. A little example I've given before, I see the wind chimes on my porch and I'm reminded of a previous event, a past event, where I bought those chimes as a present for my wife for her birthday. So I'm seeing the two events simultaneously, an articulated simultaneity, one in the past in the context of the present, or as Weisskrantz called it, the past by present product which amnesics can't do. That is, this is explicit memory, the localization of events 
the uh, buying of the wind chimes in time, in the past. But these two poles, the prefrontal and the hippocampus, must work in concert. And this can't happen with a damaged HPC. The schema, the fluid mobile space, isn't there to, for the event reconstruction or redintegration. Now, the truth is, even this is largely intuitively unsatisfying. Uh, for example, I look at this, and other people look at this and say, well, we're talking imagining that in that second bullet under the hippocampus, but how does this relate to actually redintegrating that event of buying the present? Uh, the wind chimes, how does that, how does that relate? Because intuitively there was some sort of complex spatial relations in that, but is that what the hippocampus isn't doing? And, and this is, we're not supporting it anymore and therefore screwing up the, uh, the uh, explicit memory. Well, this is a frustration. From a Bergson-Gibson framework, the researcher never asked the needed the right experimental questions. It, it ignores the whole invariance law aspect of events. It uh, ignores the whole possibility of, of uh, the actual complete ret retention of experiences, 40 beings. And so one is hamstrung by research done simply in the wrong framework. And then if we take Gibson with Bergson, given Bergson's model of perception, experience cannot be solely stored within the brain. If you remember, the external world, our experience, the coffee stirring, the coffee cup, is being specified precisely where it is within the external holographic field. It's not within the brain. Given his model of perception and add in time, we are inherently four dimensional beings. But time is a subject, the nature of time, unbelievably not even considered by the memory theorist. The fact is, theory is being unwillingly driven to this. All sites in the brain are processing sites, not storage sites. Whether driven by the present or by the past, as I discussed heavily in number 31 on language, driven by the past. The hippocampus is entirely occupied by processing the ongoing event in whatever mode that seems to be, largely the schematic space embedding. Experience is not being stored in the hippocampus or being consolidated by the hippocampus in cortical sites. This consolidation notion is appearing to collapse. The more the spatial role of the hippocampus and in events is understood, nor can experience be so stored. If memory theory would ever begin factoring in Gibson, its static world model would collapse instantly not to mention if it actually began thinking about the nature of time. Yes, integration of past experience is going on as the event is observed, but past experience is not being reconstructed or constructed in any way that these models and their incoherence envisage. But this is a subject for another discussion. Just a couple short postscripts. Pere Kritzwell, AI will equivalence human intelligence by 2045, and then go beyond. This notion is often based on the achievement of WBE, that is whole brain emulation, the mapping of the neural structure and linkage of the entire brain. In a review of the book, The Future of the Brain on Amazon, I noted the neuroscientist author's reservations on any quick advancement on this subject. The prime one, we have no idea how experience is stored in the brain. So how are we going to understand the map? Just look at this. Just for one small area of the brain, the hippocampus, you're starting from Scoville and HM in 1956. We're talking near 65 years of constant research. If from Bergson and before, for the role of the temporal lobe was already generally guessed at, around 130 years, and still little real understanding. And if they stay in the current metaphysic, it will be 1,000 years. These AI predictions 
are based on someone's total lack of appreciation of the actual state of affairs. Now the current metaphysic, 1,000 years. The question of the nature of time, how does one do memory theory without looking at this, without unearthing one's implicit assumptions, without examining one's metaphysic? Yet a totally missing discussion in memory theory today. And for that matter, in consciousness, the hard problem, qualia, all these subjects. And as we know for Bergson, this was the key for whether experience is stored in the brain is the key to the problem of consciousness. And key to this, the nature of time. So obvious, so reasonable, so strangely missing. So down the road, definitely more on current memory research. Physics and the holographic principle, still on there. QM's origin in the black body and photoelectric effect. Temporal consciousness subject. A couple more I've seen. The supposedly most powerful theory of consciousness today, the integrated information theory. Also the illusion theory of consciousness. And I've got several others on the list, so we'll just say something else. So next we'll see. Till then, signing off.